Okay, let's get started. Good morning and thank you for joining today's virtual event, Engaging the Artemis Generation, hosted by Senator Chris Coons and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. They will be joined by Delaware's Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long and NASA astronaut Dr. Jeanette Epps. I would like to remind participants that this event is being recorded and all participants will be muted for the duration of the event. I'm honored to introduce today's host, Senator Chris Coons, who proudly represents Delaware in the United States Senate. He sits on the Senate Appropriations Committee, Commerce, Justice, and Science Subcommittee, which funds NASA. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to our host, Senator Chris Coons. Um, thank you, and thank you so much uh, to everyone who's joining us for this exciting WebEx broadcast, to um, Jim Bridenstine, who is the NASA Administrator, uh, for helping organize and hosting today's event um, and for connecting us with Dr. Jeanette Epps. Um, there are more than 250 Delaware students uh, joining us. Uh, as I hope you all know, but as you certainly will all learn today, NASA's Artemis mission has the goal of landing a woman on the moon by 2024, and it's something that I am grateful NASA is championing. Uh, and to NASA astronaut Dr. Jeanette Epps, it is a huge honor uh, to be here with you today. You've had an amazing journey um, so far as a physicist, a CIA analyst, an astronaut. Um, wow, just wow. And uh, so many kids were excited to hear from you today. To my friend and colleague in public service, uh, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, um, thank you for joining uh, today. It is always uh, great to work with you uh, and to see your efforts encouraging more women and underrepresented youth um, to see the excitement and the possibility of careers in STEM. Uh, and helping with improved classrooms and investment uh, in science education here in Delaware. My role is simple. Um, it's to connect uh, you, Dr. Jeanette Epps, um, to some incredible young minds in Delaware. Uh, we reached out uh, to FAME, a statewide organization that does amazing work uh, in connecting minorities to um, science and technology opportunities. And we reached out to Delaware's uh, space grant students when we wanted um, to start. So. Uh, my hope is that uh, your answers to some of their questions will inspire some of the folks uh, on this WebEx today to think more seriously about careers in uh, space and in particular in science. Um, I've gotten to know FAME over 25 years. They were a great partner. Uh, I, I guess it's more like 35 years now uh, when I ran a youth mentoring program in the east side of Wilmington. Um, some of our most promising, most uh, science-oriented youth participated in FAME programs. Uh, and more recently, uh, I helped connect them to Boeing, which has a major manufacturing facility just a few year, a few miles from here up in Pennsylvania. Um, Boeing also needs to recruit and hire um, STEM graduates and has been um, a significant supporter of FAME recently. And um, we've also invited folks who are students at uh, Delaware State University, Wesley College at Dell Tech and at uh, the University of Delaware. Um, all of those have some participation in space grant funding, um, and we've been particularly successful uh, here in Delaware. We got another four-year, $3 million space grant um, that helps us with engaging um, minorities, women, first-generation students of all backgrounds uh, in STEM degrees. So they've performed uh, above the space grant goals, and so we were thrilled um, that they renewed. A majority of our space grant awardees are to women, uh, and I think 51%, uh, in fact, I think that's a refreshing uh, number for us to celebrate. Um, Delaware is also where some significant NASA-related, NASA-funded work in heliophysics happens. Uh, and I'm pleased with the investment we've gotten from NASA uh, for the heliophysics team uh, here in Delaware, uh, which helps provide timely warnings uh, for folks here on Earth about solar events that might uh, disrupt or be dangerous to communications. Uh, or to human health. So um, I hope that we will incorporate in our conversation today um, how a diverse scientific workforce helps our national security, uh, helps manufacturers, and help us be competitive globally. Um, and Dr. Epps, I just was thrilled when looking back on your accomplishments so far um, to see that you'd worked for one of our countries, our world's leading manufacturers at Ford, um, that you'd helped our nation's security through the CIA, and that you are now helping expand the frontiers of science and human exploration uh, at NASA. So I am excited for today's conversation 
and to ask questions presented by a number of Delaware students. And I'm gonna hand it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Bethany Hall Long, our Lieutenant Governor. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, so much to our US Senator, Chris Coons, who has been an ardent supporter of young scientific minded individuals in our state who has been so passionate about making sure Delaware has the best resources and truly has the commitment to STEM as well as you hear to the space grants. I am not going to speak long because I know our students are so excited to hear from Dr. Epps. All I can say to you today as your Lieutenant Governor, but also a research scientist at the University of Delaware and a professor, how really important it is that each of you are taking these opportunities, whether through fame, through the space grant program, as growing minds and student opportunities. I myself, you know, a lot of times people assume that I probably grew up in a family who went to college and had opportunity, but quite not the case. I was raised in a very uh, rural farming area. No one in my family went to college and I was the first to pursue that and to go on and get my doctoral research, not only in nursing, but as a research scientist. So having spent some time in the laboratory, around environmental health, having spent a lot of time in population health. And wow, has that ever been important during this pandemic to have those experiences? So I just wanna say, keep your minds open, take those opportunities. And thankfully we have great leaders like our United States Senator, but we also have incredible individuals who are wonderful trailblazers and role models like Dr. Epps. But prior to hearing from her today, uh, I am going to turn this over uh, to the lead administrator here that's joined us, uh, thanks to uh, their commitment to seeing the work of fame in the space grant program, Dr. Jeff Bridenstine. And again, I just am so ex excited to be part of this. And uh, I uh, regret I will fade off video in a moment because uh, of schedule, but we will be listening and tracking your questions. So. Uh, Senator Coons, I believe you wanted me to turn this over uh, to uh, Mr. Bridenstine at this point, unless you had something else you wanted to add as the host. Uh, no, thank you. Well, let's invite uh, the NASA administrator who is responsible for the strategic direction uh, of NASA to address our participants now. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Senator Coons, and, and thank you to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, Hall Long, whom um, I know is very engaged in all of the STEM activities, and, and that's really where, where NASA is headed. We're, we want to inspire the next generation into science, technology, engineering, and math. And I also want to thank Senator Coons uh, for his leadership on the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Committee. Um, you know, NASA has a strong budget. NASA is one of those areas that um, it really brings people together. Um, and and if you look even across the globe, NASA has brought countries together. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those areas where Republicans and Democrats and, and nations around the world can come together and say, look, we need to be thinking strategically for the next 30 years. What do we want to accomplish? How do we want to expand our knowledge, our, our, our scientific achievements? And, um, and Senator Coons has been uh, significant in that way, and we're very grateful for that, for that leadership that you provide. Ultimately, um, you know, when, when we try to make programs multi, not just multi-decadal, but multi-generational, uh, it requires strong bipartisan leadership. And we're so grateful for what you've done, Senator Coons. A couple of things that I think are important that I know there's people that are listening that are even in middle school or high school, or even college. Um, the, the future is bright in space exploration and space science and discovery. Uh, we think about what's happening right now in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. Um, we're advancing capabilities and technologies that are going to be transformational for human life right here on Earth. That's why we do what we do. So what is the value of having this orbit laboratory, the International Space Station, in orbit around the, the Earth? What is the value of it? The value is the microgravity of space. Imagine being able to compound pharmaceuticals in microgravity in a way that you cannot do here on the Earth. Or uh, imagine being able to advance immunizations in microgravity in a way that you can't do within the gravity well of Earth. Immunizations like for salmonella, 
which in the United States, people think, well, salmonella, that's not a really big problem. But if you go to a lot of countries that are not as fortunate as the United States, I know Senator Coons is very focused on Africa, for example. You know, it's the third leading cause of death of infants in countries that are not as fortunate. So we really need to be thinking about how do we advance these immunizations? We've advanced immunizations, for example, for um, for uh, uh, pneumonia, which has been transformational for human life here on Earth. But it goes beyond that. Right now, we're proving that we can use adult stem cells. In fact, your own skin cells. We can use your own skin cells to create your own tissue in the microgravity of space. If we try to do it in the gravity well of Earth, the tissue just goes flat. But when we do it in space, it can grow in three dimensions. And that opens up an opportunity uh, for us to do all kinds of magnificent things eventually maybe even creating your own organs for you. Um, and what we're trying to do is fundamentally change the economics of space. So if, for example, um, we, we can save lives and improve the human condition here on Earth by using this valuable resource that is microgravity, or think of it as zero gravity, those are the kind of things that we're focused on. Right now, we're proving with advanced materials we can create materials so thin that we can replicate the retina of a human eyeball. So somebody who has macular degeneration doesn't have to lose their eyesight. That's gonna be transformational for all kinds of people around the globe. So imagine flying a box that fits in the size of your hand. And in that box are all the materials and all the robotics to ultimately provide a thousand artificial retinas that are each reimbursed by insurance at about $50,000 a piece. All of a sudden the business case closes and people will go and, and do these kind of activities with, with not just government resources, but public private partnerships so that we can save lives and improve lives here on, on, on planet earth. That's what this is all about. So we're working quickly to, to commercialize these capabilities. A lot of you have seen that we launched a, a, a SpaceX rocket not too long ago with our two astronauts, Bob and Doug. That was part of what was called the Commercial Crew Program. Jeanette Epps, who's going to talk in just a few minutes, she's part of that Commercial Crew Program, and she's going to go to the International Space Station on another commercial vehicle called Starliner, which is built by Boeing. So we're very excited to see her great work on the International Space Station um, and ultimately what we're really focused on in low Earth orbit is commercialization so that we can, we can use American taxpayer dollars to do things for which there is not yet a commercial marketplace, always thinking about how to commercialize for the benefit of humanity. So the next big place to go after low Earth orbit is the moon. And when we go to the moon, this time when we go, we want to stay. As much as we love the Apollo program, I'll tell you, one of, one of the challenges I have with the Apollo program is that it ended. I didn't get to see it. I, I'm the first NASA administrator in history that wasn't alive to see people living and working on another world. We have to make sure that I'm the last NASA administrator in history that wasn't alive when we had people living and working on another world. So, so we need to go back to the moon. This time when we go to the moon, we're going to stay. We're going to do science. We discovered hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the South Pole of the moon, which is life support. So H2O, oxygen, of course, is necessary for breathing. Um, H2O is necessary for drinking. And of course, hydrogen itself is power. It's the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles. It's the same rocket fuel that will power the SLS rocket, which will take our astronauts to the moon here in a few short years. So all of these things conspire to say, we can do more on the moon now than ever before. We can use the resources of the moon to live and work for long periods of time. And we go with a purpose. We go because we wanna build the architectures that enable humanity to go to Mars. I, wanna, I just wanna talk for a second about what we know about Mars that has changed just in the last couple of years, because I know there's young people out there that, that might want to one day go to Mars and there's gonna be an opportunity to do that. I really, really believe that. Um, here, here's, what we, here's what we have learned in just the last few years. We've learned that Mars is covered in complex organic compounds. The building blocks for life are all over Mars. Now, they don't exist on the moon. 
at all, but they're all over Mars and of course they're all over the Earth. We have also discovered on Mars what we believe to be liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What do we know about liquid water on Earth? Wherever it exists, there's life. Is that true on Mars? We don't know, but I really believe we should go find out. And then finally, uh, we have found that the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. So each one, and what does that mean? That could be biological in nature, or it could be geological in nature. We don't know, but here's what we do know. The probability of finding life on another world keeps going up. And, and, and I think it's important that we work every day with our international partners to put together a coalition of nations that can go and make these very important discoveries um, because it will forever add chapters to history books and science books. Um, and, and, it, and it will just it will just crack open how much we still don't know and how much is left to discover and learn. Uh, and I also want to be clear, I, I'm not talking about finding bunny rabbits on Mars or anything like that. I'm talking about maybe finding microbial life, which would be stunning in itself. So we have a, a big agenda at NASA, and I'm certainly excited about the future, and I'm thankful to the senator for all of his great support for our programs. And now I get to introduce somebody who I think everybody is really excited about, and of course, uh, that is Dr. Jeanette Epps, who um, is a phys physicist by undergraduate training. Of course, she went on to get a master's degree and a PhD in aerospace engineering. And then, of course, as Senator Coons talked about, she had a great career with Ford, a great career with the CIA serving her country. And then she decided because she hadn't done enough, she wanted she wanted to become a NASA astronaut. And of course, um, she she has been selected. She's been training, um, and now she's been selected for a mission, a mission to low Earth orbit to to go to the International Space Station, and to advance all of these capabilities that we've been working on in low Earth orbit. Uh, but ultimately, look, uh, she is one of those astronauts that very well could one day find herself walking on the moon. And so this is very, very exciting for, for all of us at NASA. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Jeanette Epps. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Administrator. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with all the students and with the Administrator, the Senator, and the Lieutenant Governor. I hope you guys feel the excitement. Um, every time the Administrator speaks, I get this um, sense of excitement that I feel all the time because I get to be one member of the team of space explorers at NASA along with the administrator. But I, I just happen to be one of the, um, the astronauts. And so I get to be one of the visible um, people that you see, but there's so many more to this team. And um, what I'd like to do today is um, I have so much I wanna tell you guys. I want you guys to be very successful. So. I wanna tell you a little bit about the training that we do um, so that you can know what you need to do in the future and how to get, how to apply to the astronaut corps, what things you need, what we do. Um, I want you to feel the excitement. I want you to join. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little bit about my background, some of the training, just a little bit about the commercial crew program and then talk about Artemis and show you some of the team members that are working on that. So um, bear with me, I'm gonna go to uh, our, what's that? Okay, great. I'm gonna go to my slide presentation. I have a lot of slides, but what I'd like to do is I'm gonna flip through a lot of these. I want you guys to um, think of questions as I'm flipping through this and I'm gonna go really fast because there's so many slides, but I wanna give you time to ask as many questions at the end. So my background, I grew up in Syracuse. I went to a really small Jesuit school in upstate New York where I earned a bachelor's in physics. And then I went on to the University of Maryland to major in aerospace engineering. And so you guys would be surprised to know that after high school, I spent another 11 years in, uh, in school. And after um, aerospace engineering, I went on to Ford Motor Company. Some students may wonder why I did that, but as an engineer, you really can apply your trade to just about any vehicle. Like for example, I worked on helicopters in graduate school, and then I did the exact same thing for cars at the Ford Motor Company. And while working there, another company recruited me and I went on to work at the Central Intelligence Agency as the administrator and the uh, senator said earlier. 
So as I'm working there, I learned to be not just technical, but an operator. And what that means is like being a fighter pilot who can operate the heli helicopter or fighter aircraft um, versus being the scientist who may not be able to fly one, but I can design one. So while working there, I decided to apply to the astronaut corps and I was selected in 2009 with the, um, <laughs> the chumps. So just to go into a little bit of training, what you're gonna see now is you're gonna see many pictures of me training, but don't think I like pictures of me. I want you to visualize yourself doing all of these things because if I'm doing these things, there's absolutely no reason you can't do these things. So one of the first things we learn to do is fly the T-38 trainer. You may wonder why we do that. Well, from one piece of equipment, the fighter aircraft, we get a ton of training and we can continue to practice all of that training while flying the jet. One of the first things is that we learn how to work together. I'm not a fighter pilot. The front seater is a fighter pilot. We have to learn to work together in order to fly the jet in a high threat environment and land it safely. We also practice how we can talk to mission control as we communicate with air traffic control. Um, sitting in that back seat in that tiny seat with a helmet on and a um, harness, it's a very small area. And so it's kind of like being in the suit when you're doing a spacewalk. So you kind of learn to be slightly uncomfortable, but perform at a really high level. And the last thing is that for um, robotics, the track and capture aspect of robotics, you can sort of practice as you're flying the jet and you're tracking the flight director. So we get a ton of training out of one piece of equipment. So if you ever hear them wanting to cancel our jets, tell them, no, 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 we have, we get too much training out of it. So I'm gonna flip through the next few slides really fast. I want you to think of your questions and ask them at the end. And remember, visualize yourself doing all of these things. So extravehicular activity, also known as um, spacewalking. We have to learn how to do that before we can graduate. And then we continue to practice that as, we, um, as we're in the core and waiting for an assignment. Robotics, very important. Um, as you can see in the image, you have one of your colleagues on the end of the arm. So you really wanna practice your robotics and be very good at it. Build medical training. So on the flight that I will be on with Sunita Williams and Josh Cassida, we may not have a medical doctor on there. So one of us will have to be the chief medical officer. And that's why we go through so much field medical training. Russian language. So a third of the space station is Russian. And so we can have up to three members of our crew Russian. And so Rus learning the Russian language goes a long way for camaraderie. And also if you're flying on the Soyuz, it helps you understand the panels, reading the procedures. So it's a very important thing that we do. Field geology, as you guys know, you are the Artemis generation. So one of the big things we'll do on the moon is geology. A couple other things that we do um, for learning to be more self-aware, learning to understand our colleagues is we do these outdoor leadership training seminars. And it's where we're out in the middle of nowhere. In this case, we were in Moab, Utah, and we were we camped out for 10 days. And as you can see, I had a pink shirt on. You would think that that was over um, one day, but the, for 10 days I had the same shirt, same pants. And so you, you become very uncomfortable, but you become very self-aware of how you behave in these expeditionary events. And so they're very important for our training so that we can learn to live together and uh, get along. So as students, one of the things you'll learn is that you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you really can't get along with others, you're not gonna go very far. So, you know, as the smartest person in the room, you have to learn to be flexible and adaptable and how to get along with people from many different cultures and backgrounds. More of our knowles. This was um, the second time that I went, which was in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Then another, um, well, actually on that trek, we were learning decision-making. We were in extreme terrain um, and we really learned how to live together. And we were building relationships. And as you can see in this image, um, Sunita Williams, she, is, uh, she will be my commander on the Boeing Starliner. A couple other things that we do, we do a lot of analog missions. And one of my favorite things that I did was I lived underwater for nine days with these uh, three gentlemen here. And um, it, it sounds like um, you know, a weird thing to do, but it's one of the best things to do, if you're not on the space station, 
uh, living underwater, you can't just leave and ascend to the surface because you may get something called decompression sickness. So this is one of the best ways to kind of figure out another way of self-awareness, learning to work with other people, being in small spaces with each other and really getting along. So this image here just shows you how small the habitat was. Uh, it was located off the coast of Florida. It was about 50 feet under um, the surface. And so that we were at, a, at about two and a half atmospheres. As you can see, it was an analog mission where we simulated what we would do if we went to an asteroid. We would have to set up a drill. We would do excursions. And as you can see, we had a little fun. Um, the excursions wouldn't take place with someone on your shoulders, but you can have fun in these. You work hard and you can have lots of fun as well. Another analog event that I took part in was living in a cave for five days. So we were in Slovenia. We lived um, in a cave that was, um, it, it was really otherworldly. And some of the things we did were trying to figure out what we would do if we went to the moon. And there, was, uh, there were a lot of things in this event that kind of um, made me think that we were on another planet and we were investigating another planet. How would we explore that place? Um, how would we, would we look for uh, microbes? What would we look for while we're there? So these events are all analog missions that you would do and it would simulate living together, exploring together and doing research together. And as you can see, it's, and this is a very small group and you really have to learn to be flexible and adaptable and apply your tradecraft to it. So all of this training leads to training for a specific vehicle. And so all of that training that you saw, that's the generic astronaut training. And so we would train um, all the way up until being assigned and then you would train for a specific vehicle. For example, if you were training to fly in the Soyuz, you would go to Star City and then you would learn how to don the suit that they have for that vehicle, how to sit in the chair, how to do a leak check in your suit, you would do water survival with that um, in that vehicle. Uh, and then you would do winter survival in particular for the Soyuz since they had a landing in Siberia. And so this was the worst case scenario, but there's different types of training for each vehicle that you would have to do. You would have exams, <laughs> lots of exams. And then, um, you know, that's just for one vehicle. So, and that's all to go to the International Space Station. And so what that, um, so at the International Space Station, as you know, as an astronaut, our job is to train, to fly to space. On the space station, we would conduct an experiment and we would maintain the space station. And that space station could be the International Space Station, but it also could be a space station around the moon. So with that, um, just a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. So why do we do microgravity research? I think the administrator talked um, a little bit about this earlier, but I wanted to impress upon students how different things can be and look once you take away the force of gravity. So the force of gravity masks a lot of the processes um, that take place here on Earth. And so you really don't know the true nature of things until you get you take away that one force that masks everything. And as shown in this um, image here, you have a candle that is elongated um, here on Earth, but in space, you can see that it's sort of rounded. And that's because you don't have this convection of lighter particles floating up and heavier particles floating down. Yeah, I'm cutting in and out here. So um, it's very in. Okay. So you can see that, um, on Earth, there's a lot of, um, of issues with um, the force, the gravity, um, the gravitational force masking things. So in space, we know that certain, when you take away for the force of gravity, you have certain things like your genes that are expressed and some that aren't expressed. Um, the administrator talked about salmonella and how it becomes more virulent in space. Once you take away the force of gravity, you can see the true nature and then you can start designing things and developing things around the true nature of, of a thing. And even then we can start developing countermeasures to how the body reacts to being in low um, gravity. And then also we can start developing things for when we get out of the Earth's protection. So there's a lot of neat things that we can do when we um, take away the force of gravity and so much more research. So 
currently, um, we have mainly a crew cargo, um, a cargo capability to the space station. And now we have SpaceX as well that's taking our astronauts to the space station. Up until that launch last May, we only had the Soyuz um, to go to the International Space Station, but now we have SpaceX Dragon. Uh, let me go to that. And, uh, and then I'm gonna have to go back. And we have the Boeing CST-100. So for each of these vehicles, you have the generic training that you would do as an astronaut, and then you would have specific training for the vehicle that you're flying on. So I'll fly on the Boeing CST-100, and I will have to, um, I think um, I'm gonna not talk so much about this because there's a lot of proprietary things that are happening with that right now, and I'm training to that. So in the near future, you'll you'll learn a lot more about the Boeing CST-100. Um, I, I noticed at the top that I still have 2017. That date has changed, as you know. And so um, hopefully in the near future, I can give you more details on the Boeing CST-100, but I'm very excited to fly on Boeing. I've worked with Boeing in the past. It's a great company to work with as well as SpaceX. Um, so um, look for that in the near future. So with that, I wanna go on to talk a little bit about Artemis. And one of the things here, you'll see Marsha Langstrom's name at the bottom. And I wanted to thank her. She's another team member um, at NASA. Um, and uh, she um, put together a lot of these slides on Artemis. She's one of the uh, um, people who talk a lot about um, Artemis. And I recently did a, uh, an event with her and several other members of the team. And I wanted to make sure they got credit for what they do. I'm one of the few people who work on this. I just happen to be one of the more visible people. But there's great people behind the scenes like Mar Marsha Langstrom, who really helped get, put everything together and get us all um, into space. So Artemis phase one, and so we hope to be to the lunar surface by 2024. We are working diligently to that end. And as you can see, there are several stages that will take to get there. Because we're working in these stages, we're working out issues. We're working on how to do things properly to get us to um, moon. So one of the things that we're um, the components of the Artemis program, and let me just go back for a second. So the Artemis program is the NASA program to get us back to the moon. But it's not to just take us back to the moon. We want to include women this time. And of course, um, you guys are included as well. Um, we just wanted to make it a point to say that this time we're gonna take the other 50% of the population along with us. And so we're gonna be much, much more inclusive. Everyone's involved. We're gonna have other nations involved in getting us all back to the moon, but not just getting there, we're gonna stay there. And we're gonna work and live on the moon. And a lot of the stuff that we do is gonna translate back here to earth, but it's also gonna translate to developing a capability to get us to Mars eventually. So you guys are the Artemis generation. I want you guys to start thinking of ways, um, uh, you know, how and what can we do at the moon in order to advance uh, getting deeper into space. So with that said, I wanted to uh, talk just a little bit about the components of Artemis. So one is the a space launch on system, that's the big rocket. And on top of the rocket will be the Orion um, Apollo-like capsule that will take us to the moon. So just a little more. So this image here, this is courtesy of our guys working <laughs> diligently on the space launch uh, system. As you can see, it is gonna be a Saturn V-like um, vehicle that will get the um, Apollo, Apollo-like capsule, the Orion, to the moon. I'm gonna flip through a lot of this really fast so that you can um, have time to ask a lot of questions. So this just shows the rollout of the Artemis core stage. I love this image so you can see many different um, members of the team, the NASA team that's getting us into space and helping us stay on the moon. So these are great images showing you how far along we are with developing the Artemis, the Orion, sorry, the Orion um, crew module. So this is um, a great image showing you the um, entire vehicle without the outer shell. And here's, um, wow, that's a great image. So this is where it, when it was testing at the Plumbrook station. And this is a test of the launch of um, the pad abort system that will, if anything goes wrong on the launch pad, um, we can get 
all of the astronauts on board away safely. And this is one of the images I wanted to show you. When I said we're a team, as you can see here, there's many, many parts of the team, many people involved. And I hope that you seeing this, you'll want to be a part of the team. You can become an astronaut. You can be one of the people that help build up the Orion or the um, space launch system. You can develop experiments that will be conducted on the moon. There's all kinds of ways that you can be a part of the team here at NASA. So some of the other components of the Artemis program um, will have a lunar gateway. And the lunar gateway will be a way station that's in lunar orbit, but it'll be a launch pad from lunar orbit to the surface of the moon. So there's, this is gonna be an, a very interesting um, gateway because it will have a highly elliptical orbit. And that means that we can go to different locations on the surface of the moon. And I think we're gonna try something new with that. Um, so electric propul propulsion is gonna be, is one of the new um, cool ways of um, leaving the lunar gateway and um, getting to the surface. So um, I, I won't talk too much in detail on that since I haven't been a part of that, but that is something that you as students, when you're thinking of research and things that you wanna do, if you're in aerospace, electric propulsion is the next big thing. A human landing system. So this is a plat this is a, uh, the landing system that will be docked at the orbital, at the um, gateway platform. And it'll be a way to um, for the Orion to dock to the uh, lunar gateway. And then from the lunar gateway, you would uh, go on to the human landing system and then you would go to the surface of the moon. That in and of itself is gonna be amazing. That's relatively new. Um, we recently had a baseline review um, completion that took place, I think last week in fact. And right now we have three companies working on that. That's Blue Origin, SpaceX and Dynetics. So, um, look into that as well. That's something, that's another way you can be a part of the team. So with that, I want to end. Uh, I probably took a little bit more time than I should have, but I wanted to make sure that you guys understand that you are the Artemis generation. There is so many ways to participate in getting us back to the moon, staying on the moon, and then eventually to Mars. So I hope that um, I, I've kind of inspired you um, to follow your dreams. I was one of those students who never thought they would pick me to be an astronaut. And so I made my career everything that I wanted to be. And it was um, the excitement of getting into that astronaut program that took me away from my career, but that was the only thing that could. So I encourage you to follow your dreams and uh, know that they can take you to unexpected, wonderful places, even the moon. So with that, I'll end there and um, we can go on to questions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Epps. Um, thank you for sharing with us uh, both um, your own journey training and uh, preparation and then the exciting vision for Artemis and for the next generation of spaceflight. Uh, I was actually at the last space shuttle launch with my son, uh, one of my twin boys uh, when he was just 10. I can't believe it's already been a decade um, and my daughter and I got a chance to actually get in uh, one of the capsules uh, that are being developed um, for this next generation of space flight. Thank you uh, for sharing all of uh, your work and your life and your vision. Um, we've got a dozen questions and about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna try and ask them quickly. Um, Administrator Bridenstein is in Oklahoma and there is a storm system going right over top of him. Um, so one of the things that you modeled uh, is flexibility, um, threat awareness, uh, and teamwork. Let's just, uh, we'll roll forward. I will keep asking questions in less than until we see him come back. I see he's come back. Um, so um, I will ask the first question if I could. This is from Jennifer Mills. Um, she is a fourth year PhD student in chemical engineering at the University of Delaware and a space grant fellow. Um, how has your background in engineering prepared you for your work as an astronaut? Uh, and how is your background different from other astronauts uh, in the program? And, and how is the diversity of experiences considered when assembling a crew for a specific mission? Well, to answer the first part, um, uh, my um, background in engineering truly is, a, is an asset. Um, but, you know, it's learning to... Um, learn is the big thing. And so going from physics to engineering, 
to me, um, and then working at Ford and the CIA, you learn that science is science and you learn to apply what you learn to different systems. Going from working on helicopters in graduate school to vehicles was, it was seamless for me, only because I was applying engineering principles to another system. And so you really teach yourself how to learn um, many different things. So that's the flexibility and adaptability that I talked about in being an astronaut. There's so many different aspects of that you have to learn and you have to um, act upon as an astronaut. And so being flexible and adaptable is, is very important. And then my career, you know, one of the big things that I noticed was when I worked at Ford, I worked mainly in the lab. I was very technical. Um, I, I was very, um, I didn't have a lot of operational experience. And as I said, operational meaning, you know, I could be a fighter pilot who really doesn't have a background in aerospace, but I know how to fly the plane. I know how to test the plane as well, but I may not be able to design it. And I can be an aerospace engineer who can design a plane or a helicopter, but I can't necessarily fly it. And so when you have these two um, aspects come together, you're really technical and operational. And that's, to me, was how um, an astronaut has to act and behave. There's times when you have experiments on board and it's your technical background and experience that can help you, um, help you help the scientists on the ground conduct a successful experiment. So there, there's many different ways that um, uh, an engineer, um, a scientist, and becoming more operational, um, it just all fits together very well. Great, thank you. Administrator? Yes, sir. Okay, so I've got a, uh, a question here from Sydney Hall. She's a senior graduate student at Wesley College of Dover, Delaware, and this is a question for astronaut uh, Dr. Jeanette Epps. Um, and I think this is actually perfect for you, Dr. Epps. Uh, I was unaware that you had done that underwater training. Um, it looks like it was fun, but it looks like it would have been fun for a short period of time, maybe not for nine days. Um, but, but here's the question. It says, how does being in space and being so far away from loved ones and civilians impact the crew's mental health? Well, I think that this, a lot of this goes back to the people who really want to become astronauts. Um, we love our families, but we also love what we do. And so living underwater for nine days and you're away from your family, we still had contact, you know, through phones, through um, different um, media while underwater. And it's the same now on the space station. So we have near continuous communications with the ground. The crew members have telephones that, um, well, they're kind of like communications through their laptops to talk to their loved ones on earth. They can call them. So there's different ways that you can maintain your, um, just your emotional stability. I mean, we as a crew, we get along well, we have a common mission. And so that bonds us together. We do have, um, we have separate crew quarters. So if you need a minute where you just like, I'm an introvert and I love my, I love Sonny and Josh and we've already had a lot of fun together. But you know, being an introvert, sometimes you just want to go into your crew quarters and read a book. And so on station, we have means to read electronic books. We even have movies. So you really don't feel like you're so separated from the rest of the world. And I really do think that, especially like living underwater, the nine days went by so fast, but that's partly because we bonded as a group. Aki Hoshide from the Japanese Space Agency, Thomas Pesquet from the European Space Agency, Mark Van de Heij, and then we had two half techs. So there was a total of six of us. And we're all from different places, but because we bonded around having a common mission, I, I think um, it made things much more lively and much more fun that time went by so quickly. Um, I've got a question, if I might, um, to both of you, um, to Dr. Epps and to Administrator Bridenstine. Um, this is from Xavier Carroll, Xavier Carroll at Eastside Charter School. Um, are we planning to mine asteroids uh, and if so, would we be mining them uh, up in orbit or would we take pieces of asteroids and somehow uh, bring them either to the earth or to the moon to mine them there? That's a, that's a, that's a good question. I'll, I'll go first and then I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Epps. Um, so when we think about 
the moon. Uh, and this is an interesting thing, and I, I don't think people think about it very much. But, you know, every once in a while, we find these 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 meteorites that have impacted the Earth. Um, and 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 they sometimes have very valuable metals in them, very precious, but very and metals that are very important for national security, for example, uh, platinum group metals. And 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 a lot of these what we call rare earth metals are not earth metals at all. These rare earth metals are in fact asteroid impacts from billions of years ago. Uh, and the problem with the earth is that it has a very active geology and a very active hydrosphere with lots of water and a very active atmosphere. And so anything that impacted the earth billions of years ago is not today where it was billions of years ago. And so, so that's why these rare earth metals are so traced. And when you find them, they're not, they're, they're hard, they're hard to come by and they're very valuable. And in some cases you have to buy them from countries that are not friendly to the United States. Well, it just so happens that these rare earth metals are not earth metals, they're metals from space and the moon, look at the moon, look at all of the impacts that you can see on the moon. And, and it doesn't have an active geology. It doesn't have an active atmosphere. It doesn't have an active hydrosphere. So anything that impacted the moon billions of years ago is today right where it was billions of years ago, which means there could be a lot of resources on the moon. There could be a lot of resources on asteroids. Some of you saw just last week, we, we touched down to take a sample of an asteroid in deep space. And we, we were so successful. We collected so much material that we couldn't get we couldn't get it to the 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 head of the 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 uh, the, the the mechanism the the arm. We couldn't get it to close. We, now we're we're storing the material. It's all going to be fine. But every asteroid is very different, and things that impact the Earth, the things that impact the Moon are very different. There could be lots of valuable resources there, and and in fact, those resources could change uh, the balance of power on Earth depending on what gets discovered. Um, so it's important that we maintain a leadership in this exploration and discovery of the moon and, of course, even deeper into space. Um, so the, the answer is yes, I think it's important for us to continue to do science. NASA is not an, we're not an agency, we're not a chartered to go mine or extract resources, that's not our job. Our job is to do discovery and science exploration. But look, there are people out there and industry that is out there and they are interested in getting resources from space. And so, and so we make the discoveries, we share, we share the knowledge that we have, um, and then other people can go make the investments and apply their efforts to go extract the resources if that's something they wanna do. Uh, it's not in our mission set as an agency, but it's certainly something that we need to think about as we explore space. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Epps. Well, there's, there's not much I can add to that. That was very well, I mean, especially better than I could have said. <laughs> Only thing I wanna add is that the students should start thinking about ways to extract these um, precious metals. I mean, different things from the surface of the moon. Um, you have one sixth of the gravity of earth and developing new technology that can do that is gonna be crucial. So good luck you guys in thinking about that. Administrator, we've got like eight more questions in about four more minutes. So okay, I'll um, go quick. <laughs> see if you want to prioritize one or two. Okay, okay here we go. Um, let's see. Um, okay, this is from Eric Steinman, chemical engineering student, University of Delaware for astronaut Epps. What was the biggest takeaway from the the ESA caves and Nemo NASA experiment NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations programs? In what ways do you think these effectively simulate life in space? And do you think your training made the isolation of quarantining to avoid COVID-19 more manageable? That's an interesting dynamic. Um, quarantining, we think about how difficult it is uh, now with COVID, a lot of people have to quarantine. What have we, what have we learned from your, your experiences and from the ISS as far as quarantining? Well, um, some of the things that I took away from Nemo and Issa Caves is that, um, you know, you're in these events with a certain number of, pe of people, your crew, and it's how you bond together that makes the difference. 
And in each case, um, the group that I was with, we bonded over having this common mission together. And in caves, um, my colleague Takuya Onishi said it best. Every day we banded together to um, overcome the threat of the, the cave. So in each of these missions, they were both, um, they both had an element of real consequences. Like you could really hurt yourself in many different ways. And that's kind of like understanding the risk of space flight, understanding how to um, take care of yourself so that you're not, you're not um, I'll, I'll just say for lack of a better word, a hindrance to the group, but also how to take care of your other crewmates. So in caves, caves was probably the most extreme event that um, you could do. And don't get me wrong, Nemo was um, um, extreme as well because you're living underwater and you understand that you can't just leave the habitat and resurface because of the threat of decompression sickness. But in caves, we had these huge ravines that we would have to descend into or climb out. It was very wet. So we had to really take care of each other. So that's one of the biggest things that I walked away with in both of those ev events, that you really have to take care of your, yourself and your crew. And so quarantining is kind of the same. I mean, I think a lot of people are quarantined with other people, and then their only way to the world in some cases is through um, you know, Zoom, through Teams, through WebEx. And we have these cameras and we talk to each other through this way. And even on orbit, this is how we can communicate with our family back here on Earth. So it's, it's almost the same thing. So for me, quarantining, um, maybe there's a lot of aspects to what we do in the astronaut corps, like even the analog missions that we do, that kind of um, during quarantine were seamless because this is how we would behave in an extreme environment or on the space station. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to combine two questions briefly because we have just a few minutes left. Tavian Cooks is a junior at Delaware State, and he wants to know what are the most important qualifications to be an astronaut. And then more specifically, Brendan Swanick uh, is a second year honors biomedical engineering student at UD um, who noticed your rotorcraft research at U University of Maryland and is applying to do an identical project at Ames Research Center and wondered how your rotorcraft research helped lead you to become an astronaut. Well, quickly, what I'll say is that there is no recipe to becoming an astronaut. Um, so I always suggest to students that you should really make your career everything that you want it to be. Take calculated risks, but take them. Um, stay fit and healthy. Um, push the boundaries of who you are. Learn to skydive. Um, go on these extreme treks in Moab, Utah, um, different things like that. So I, I kind of encourage you to be um, highly technical, but get out there and do some other things. And so um, I wish I could give you a recipe. If you looked at the backgrounds of all the astronauts, you see how different, especially um, in the last five or six, four, four or five classes, you'll see how varied our backgrounds are. And so make your career everything you want it to be. Understand the requirements for the astronaut corps. Make sure you have those minimum requirements and keep um, excelling and achieving. As far as rotorcraft, um, one of the things I said earlier and um, I've learned over um, the number of years is that you know, being a scientist and applying your, what you learn to different systems is very important. So rotorcraft, Helicopters are such a complicated beast. You know, people are still surprised that they even fly. Um, it was so complicated, but you apply all those engineering principles to that one vehicle. You learn so much about engineering. You can take that and go just about anywhere. And, and that's kind of what I did. At Ford Motor Company, I worked on vibration reduction in vehicles and safety devices. And then at the CIA, um, one of the, the things that I can say is that I was an analyst and I worked on non-proliferation issues with respect to like, you know, aircraft. So you can, in, in that vein, you're kind of working as a reverse engineer. So it wasn't just rotorcraft, it's learning your engineering craft to, as, to uh, as deep of a level as you can and then applying it to different things. So I would encourage you to become extremely technical, learn how to teach yourself. And that's, that's pretty much what it boils down to, to how can you 
learn to learn. And I, I was excited to read that you, uh, you're a patent holder from your work at Ford, uh, that you're part of a, a team that applied for several patents and you're a patent holder. Administrator, uh, I think you're gonna get the last word here, maybe the last question. Okay, and uh, Senator, if, if, uh, if, if, if you wanna go a little bit longer, I can do that as well. Oh, uh, this is a question. Okay, this is a, let's see, I've got two questions here. Um, one, I think uh, Dr. Epps has already kind of answered. It's for her, it's for her, either her or me. It says, is there a college major you have to choose in order to work at NASA? And I think Dr. Epps very correctly identified that the answer is no. Um, we have a lot of diverse backgrounds at NASA. I will tell you what we look for. And I think Dr. Epps exemplifies this. What we look for at NASA is sustained superior performance. And so, so if you know STEM fields are very good, uh, but we also, you know, we, we also need people at NASA. Maybe you're not necessarily interested in being an astronaut. We need people at NASA that are good communicators, people that can talk about the missions that we're doing and why. Because remember, what we do is public, and we need to make sure that the public understands the importance of of the missions that we do and how it benefits humanity. Um, you know, for example, I like to talk about the little camera that I'm talking to right now. This this camera and this computer was designed for a robot that went to Mars back in in the the early 2000s, um, and now it's it, you know Nokia. Uh, actually, Nokia actually licensed a camera for the first time, uh, licensed the technology and put it into a cell phone. And all of a sudden, everybody on the globe now has cell phones in their cameras. Not everybody on the globe, but a lot of people. Um, they, they now have cameras in their cell phones. So um, connecting the world is something important that NASA has been able to help achieve. And um, we talk about Internet broadband from space or DirecTV, Dish Network, all these kind of things. Um, you know, there, there's a, we need communicators, we need, we need people that understand finance, we need accountants, we need all kinds of different capabilities at this agency. And so there really isn't a single way to come to NASA, um, but certainly it's a very competitive environment. Everybody wants to have NASA on their re resume. So you gotta work hard um, and, and whatever it is you're doing, do the absolute best where you are. And that's, that's how you achieve that. So, the, let's see, this one is for Dr. Epps. Um, it says, I read about the Boeing Starliner and how it can stay in space for months. Um, what exactly is the Starliner supposed to do? That's for Dr. Epps. Well, the Starliner is a commercial vehicle um, where NASA, we buy seats on a Boeing vehicle and it takes us to the International Space Station. And so the current missions to the space station can last up to six months or more. Um, and for example, in Christina Koch's case, she was there for over, um, over 10 months. So she flew on one Soyuz and then came back on another Soyuz. Um, and that's partly because there, there may be some limitations on the vehicle itself. I know in particular for the Soyuz, there is a limitation, but our requirements are for Boeing to take us to the International Space Station stay for up to seven months and then bring us back home on that same vehicle. So that's the design. And right now I can't um, go into too much detail about the vehicle. It does look like the Apollo capsule right now. Um, there's three people on the mission that I will be on, which will be the first operational Boeing Starliner. Prior to my flight, we'll have the first crew flight test, which will include Nicole Mann, Butch Wilmore, and Michael Fink. So they will do all the testing out of the vehicle. Um, they'll dock the station. They'll continue to do some checkouts and then um, they'll come back. And then um, shortly after them, we'll go to the International Space Station. Um, we don't have the specifics of our mission just yet. As we get closer and closer, we'll get more specific um, information on, our, on the uh, flight that we'll take. And um, we'll go from there. And I apologize, I can't go into too much detail because there are some proprietary things since it's a commercial vehicle. Um, so uh, hopefully in the near, near future, you'll hear a lot more about the Boeing Starliner. You've heard a lot about SpaceX and soon you'll hear a little bit more about Boeing. Um, thank you. We, we've got another question from Lily Soon Neff, uh, who graduated from Wesley College here in Delaware 
and is a second year doctoral student at Medical University of South Carolina. Um, she's asking if there's gonna be future space travel for data acquisition and safety testing prior to the Artemis uh, moonshot, um, given that there hasn't been new data acquired other than low earth orbit uh, after the Apollo space mission. Um, so what data acquisition will there be? And I would expand and say prior to going back to the moon or onwards towards Mars. Well, so right now, everything that we're yep. doing in low earth orbit, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, administrator, I don't know if you wanna to add to that one. No, go, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. You can start and then I'll, I'll say a few words as well. Well, I think you have more information than I do, but so I, I would rather you go on that one if you don't mind. Okay, sure, sure. So um, yeah, so when we think about what we need to do ahead of a moon landing, and I'm sorry, I'm breaking up here because I'm in, a, I'm in a, a rain shower. I hope you guys can hear me, um, but the, we're gonna do some ro robotic precursor missions to the moon. So we're actually gonna launch um, what we call commercial lunar payload services to the surface of the moon um, as early as 2021. And then we've got missions in 2022 and 2023. And we're gonna go and we're gonna characterize where the water ice is, how much of it is there. Is it embedded in the regolith? Could there even be pure water ice on the moon? So we're, we're gonna go uh, to the moon with robotic missions that are that are commercial in nature where nasa we're, we're paying a private company uh, to take our instruments and our rovers to the moon um, and that's the quickest way that we can achieve these outcomes so we're going to get data back we're going to we're going to understand where the volatiles are in this case the water ice we're going to we're going to make sure that we understand how we can separate that water ice from from the regolith and then ultimately we're going to need to to do all kinds of other experiments um, to make sure that we um, that, that we are doing the right science on the surface of the moon so we maximize every minute of every astronaut's time when they're on the surface of the moon. Um, and so those are those are some of the robotic pre precursor and data missions that we're gonna we're gonna have ahead of time. Okay, now we'd like to move into closing remarks. Senator Coons. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just want to thank Dr. Epps again for being with us today. Um, this was thrilling. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing uh, here in Delaware is advocating for science and scientists and for scientific exploration. I trained as a chemist. I spent eight years working for a materials-based science company, and one of the products of that company is actually now the outer layer of the spacesuit, has been since uh, the days of the Apollo mission. Um, and there's actually a company here in Dover, Delaware, ILC Delaware, ILC Dover, that manufactures uh, spacesuits for NASA and has since its earliest days. Um, we also now have a, a very first time ever dollar innovation coin uh, that, that features uh, Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, Dr. Cannon uh, was a scientist, uh, a woman born in Dover, Delaware, who actually developed the classification system for the stars. Uh, she was an astronomer. Uh, and uh, to the NASA administrator and to um, the astronaut who've joined us today, to Mr. Bridenstine and to Dr. Epps, um, I just wanted to uh, remind uh, all of the students who are on uh, that we've had folks here in Delaware looking to the stars um, for over a century. We've had folks manufacturing some of the pieces and the components that help us uh, get, get to the moon, get back into orbit and move on from there. Um, and this has been a thrilling and a compelling session. Um, so I just want to thank you both so much, uh, both for what you're doing to expand the boundaries of human knowledge and exploration, uh, and for helping bring the excitement of NASA and human space exploration to hundreds of Delaware students at all levels uh, who've joined us today. Thank you. Well, Senator Coons, I, I want to thank you for your leadership and support of NASA throughout your time in the Senate. Um, we're grateful for, for all of the support you've provided to the agency, and we hope that we can make you proud. And, and of course, Dr. Epps, we're very much looking forward to, to your future mission here to the International Space Station and even beyond. Uh, so it's an honor to be here with you, Senator. And, uh, and, and Dr. Epps, if you'd like to say a, a last word, then we'll, we'll close it out. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor and a pleasure, especially since I'm 
as I was saying earlier, Delaware is near and dear to my heart since um, my oldest sister still lives there. But um, the last words I wanna say is I wanna encourage the Artemis generation, um, participate, be a part of this. And I hope you feel the excitement from the administrator, from all the questions and some of the images that you saw. So um, I'm looking forward to the future and I hope that you are too. Go Artemis generation. All right, so, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you very much.